Children. 
So let's get filled with the Holy Ghost today. We're happy to welcome um, Adam Taylor. Yeah, we're in for a treat. We uh, had him an hour ago in our community where the epicenter is Santa Barbara County, and now we are in Ventura County, live streaming privately to Jesus Collective so that we can go back and look whenever we want. And we're going to break up into uh, howdy groups pretty soon. You can uh, be animated and talkative, or you can be quiet and silent. We're going to close with communion later. Whatever you have on hand for elements, then use that. This Wednesday is not, is this Wednesday, this Wednesday is not September 15th, but it's the 22nd. And uh, we're going to divide up uh, male and, and female. We'll, we'll start together, but then we'll break out and uh, have our talks together. That's what I was looking for. Those who identify women as women will meet and men separately will join Zoom together and then form our two groups. Um, a reminder that we're on Venmo. Um, I really, really, really appreciate uh, everyone's generosity, um, you're helping us happen. Uh, thank you for being our sponsor. And uh, this is our mailing address. Uh, the, uh, the electronic options, the links will be in chat. And the quote for today is, Quisieron enterrarnos, pero no sabían que éramos semillas. So that means they wanted to bury us, but they didn't know that we were seeds. <sighs> and uh, Hasmin is on hand to lead us in our reading today. You're free to unmute if you'd like. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Tú me has examinado y sabes todo de mí. Tú sabes cuando me siento y cuando me levanto. Aunque me sienta lejos de ti, tú conoces cada uno de mis pensamientos. Tú sabes lo que voy a decir aún antes de que las palabras salgan de mi boca. Tú siempre estás a mi alrededor, adelante y detrás de mí. Siento tu mano sobre mí. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Too great for me to understand. Espíritu me acompaña a todas partes. No puedo escapar de tu presencia. If I rise the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest ocean, even there, there your hand will guide me, and your strength will support me. Si bajara a las profundidades de la tierra, allí estarías. Si fuera al oriente donde nace el sol, allí estarías. O al occidente, al fin de los mares, allí estarías. You made all the you made all delicate, delicate inner parts, parts of my body, of my body and, and knit me together, and together in, my in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. Amen. Amen. And now, Rosie, would you lead us in prayer? Oh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting this. Okay. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. First, I want to say that it's so good to see that you are back and that you had a wonderful time. We prayed for you all the while, okay? Father, we just thank you for this precious, precious day for breath of life. 
Lord, there's so much going on all over the world. We lift up your children everywhere, no matter what the situation may be. We lift up all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray for healing. We pray for deliverance. We pray for restoration. We pray for forgiveness, Lord. Father, we thank you that we can come to you freely and openly, no matter what the situation may be. We know that you hear us. Your ears are not deaf. Your eyes are not blind and your mouth is not mute. Your hand is not too short. You know who we are. You know where we are. You know what we need. I declare healing joy, love, and peace to everyone locally and around the world. Father, I thank you for this day. Help us, each one of us, throughout this day. And Lord, may we stay ever present in your will. Holy Spirit, help guide us. Be that lamp unto our feet. Quicken our mind and our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Rosie. All right, everybody. Here's a chance to shout out to whoever you randomly get. back everybody Reverend Adam Russell Taylor is president of Sojourners uh, some of you have read or do read the magazine um, and he's the author of mobilizing hope faith inspired activism for a post civil rights generation and uh, his Next book just came out earlier this week, titled A More Perfect Union, A New Vision for Building the Beloved Community. Uh, Adam previously led the Faith Initiative at the World Bank Group and served as the Vice President in Charge of Advocacy at World Vision US and the Senior Political Director at, at Sojourners. He has also served as the executive director of Global Justice, an organization that educates and mobilizes students 
around global human rights and economic justice. He was selected for the 2009-2010 class of White House Fellows and served in the White House Office of Cabinet Affairs and Public Engagement. He is a graduate of Emory University and the Harvard University Kennedy School of Government and the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology. He also serves on the Global Advisory Board of Tear Fund UK and is a member of the inaugural class of the Aspen Institute Civil Society Fellowship. He's ordained in the American Baptist Church and the Progressive National Baptist Convention. And he serves in ministry at one of my favorite churches, um, the Alfred Street Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. And if you ever get a chance to stream them on Facebook or somewhere, YouTube, uh, try to keep up um, with Alfred Street Baptist Church. So um, I earlier uh, in the summer, early early summer to midsummer, I was in a, a couple of fora online uh, in which uh, Adam participated. And I just thought, you know what? We need to have him visit us. And uh, you'll see what I'm talking about in just a moment. But I'm going to say now, take it away, Adam Taylor. Thank you, Dr. Moore. It is a joy and a pleasure to be with you, at least virtually. Certainly wish it was in person, but uh, hence the times we're living in. But grateful that I can join you from a distance. And just has been a blessing to be a part of your, your worship, the earlier one and now uh, I guess it's still morning your time, but 2.30 <laughs> in the afternoon here in Washington, D.C. Um, as Dr. Moore mentioned, I have the privilege of serving as the president of Sojourners, and I hope that if you haven't heard about us or aren't a current recipient of our magazine, love to welcome you into our fellowship and community. It's a national, it's really a global one, but you can learn more at sojo.net and subscribe to our free newsletter if you want to learn more about us. So I am going to dwell a little bit on some of the themes of my book that came out last week, but I do intend to preach, and I do have a title that I want to tag to this message, which is Building God's Beloved Community. Building God's Beloved Community. I want to preach from a text that is very special to me because it's actually the text that I preached from in my first sermon, my kind of trial sermon, which not to date myself was 20 years ago, over 20 years ago at a church called Union Baptist Church in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I felt called to preach from the book of Corinthians, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, that I believe has some timeless truths and wisdom to speak to us today, particularly as we look out across a landscape filled with such bitter polarization. I'll speak more to that in a second. But if you have your Bible, or even if you don't, that's fine. If you would just listen as I read our text for this morning, which is going to be from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm not going to read the whole text. Hopefully it is a, a text that's familiar to you. But I'm going to start in verse 4 and then skip to verse 12, and then skip again to verse 21. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And jumping ahead to verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body 
but that its parts should have equal concern for one another. If one part suffers, all parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. I chose this background pretty intentionally. Some of you may recognize that it's a very iconic image from the civil rights struggle. I was born in the shadow of the civil rights movement. And I became convinced that my generation, Generation X, inherited the unfinished business of that movement. My black mother and white father made the controversial decision to get married in the year 1968, the same year Dr. King was assassinated and really a tragic turning point in our nation's history. So many of the gains of the civil rights movement became replaced by the Vietnam War, by riots around the country, and by a backlash against the gains of the civil rights movement. My parents instilled in me a deep and abiding belief that my diversity, and in a larger sense, our collective diversity as a nation and even as a world, is truly a gift from God, that it is a source of strength and not of weakness, that it is an asset and not a liability. Sadly, that rich diversity in all of its various forms has become one of the wedge issues that has become a fault line within our nation's politics. And I would argue is one of the subtext for the 2016 election in particular. It wasn't coincidental that in the lead up to that election, there was increasing awareness and publicity around a statistic that the Census Bureau had started to publicize that by the year 2040, we as a nation would become a nation in which white Americans would be in the minority rather than the majority. In other words, Americans of color, Asian, Black, Latino, Latina, Indigenous would be in the majority. Now, when I heard about that statistic, I saw it as a reason to be hopeful. I saw it as an expression of the brilliance and the beauty of America. But sadly, there were many that were told and were encouraged to fear that statistic, to believe that that would be an America where they would no longer have a strong place or an America that they would no longer be able to thrive. Dr. King, at the very end of his life, wrote his final book, and some of you may have read it. The title is as prescient today as it was in 1967 when he wrote it. The title was, Where Do We Go From Here? chaos or community. Well, I have a 2021 remix of Dr. King's title that is a question that I think we need to grapple with together, both as members of communities, but also members of congregations, including your own, which is this, where do we go from here? Toxic and destructive polarization or the beloved community? Everywhere we look, we see the signs of deepening polarization in our politics and our culture, and even that is seeped into our congregations. Pitch battles are raging in schools across the country about whether masks should be mandatory. President Biden's recent mandate requiring companies with over 100 employees to vaccinate or to make vaccination mandatory triggered a predictable but sad firestorm. Despite a long track record of bipartisan support, the House passed the John Lewis Voting Advancement Act about two weeks ago. And while that was a major step forward, ultimately the Senate much signed, was also passed it to sign into law. But sadly, not a single Republican member of Congress voted to strengthen or restore the strength of the Voting Rights Act, which was literally this, one of the signature achievements of the civil rights struggle. There are 400 bills that have been proposed in 48 states that Sojourners is working actively to try to reverse and to, uh, uh, to resist that are further restricting the right to vote, which in my mind, in my understanding of our faith, represents a sacred right and a sacred responsibility. States, 12 of them to be exact, are even passing legislation that are banning teachers from teaching about the whole story of our history, particularly that story of systemic racism about how it showed up in the past 
and how it continues to show up in the present, which will further whitewash and suppress a deeper understanding of our nation's history and a new generation of young people. The sheer gravity and frequency of extreme weather events have underlined the degree to which political polarization has handicapped our nation's response to the climate crisis. And beloved, polls are even showing that not only do the majority of Americans dislike and distrust people on the other political side, they are increasingly growing to hate them and to want to defeat them rather than persuade them and convert them to their point of view. Yes, we are stuck in a cold civil war that has turned increasingly hot with one horrific example being the January 6th violent, violent insurrection at the Capitol literally just blocks from where I live or at least where my office resides. Now I know you in California are no strangers to toxic polarization and you've seen some of the recent manifestations of it whether it's in the recent attempt to recall your governor, which was an ugly and bitter campaign from start to finish, or you are on the front lines of witnessing and experiencing the devastating impacts of our climate crisis, whether it's wildfires or more, which tend to have a disproportionate impact on the most vulnerable people in, in our communities. So what is the cure to this toxic polarization that has crippled our politics and our culture and even our churches? And how do we move forward? Well, answering this question compelled me to write A More Perfect Union, a new vision for building the beloved community. I realized that toxic rhetoric, hyper-partisanship and political polarization was suffocating our nation's promise and potential, causing us to not just be divided as a country, but literally, as I said before, to start to get to a place of having contempt for those who are different than ourselves. But Jesus calls us to a different path. He calls us to love our enemies. He reminds us that only perfect love can cast out fear. And as a longtime social justice advocate, I believe in the power of new narratives and of building movements that can heal and transform even our most broken politics and even our most unjust systems. I believe that we need a bigger story of us, a bigger we, the people, one that embraces everyone. We must replace the distorted and sometimes pernicious stories that we've been taught. Most recently, I would argue that the story, the narrative of Make America Great Again was an extremely effective one, but it was one that stoke some of the worst impulses of America, that at worst was a dog whistle to essentially signal making America white again. And that only a more hopeful and powerful vision can help to be the anecdote to a destructive and pernicious one. Yes, it is a time in which we must cast a bold moral vision for our future that is aligned with our deepest spiritual values and civic ideals. Now, there are many forces fueling our polarization in our society from the impact of social media and so much more. But I believe that a shared moral vision could be one of the most powerful anecdotes. And while it won't be a panacea that solves all of our ills and all of our challenges, I believe without one, we will continue to be a house divided against itself. And as Jesus described to us, a house divided against itself cannot stand. What we need is a new moral vision. And the one that has inspired me the most throughout my life is the vision of the beloved community. It was the vision that animated the civil rights movement. Certainly Dr. Martin Luther King was the one who popularized it, but so many other leaders throughout the movement also referenced and described the beloved community from Ella Baker to Fannie Lou Hamer to Bob Moses and to Congressman John Lewis, who I was extremely humbled, wrote the prologue to my book, A More Perfect Union. King understood that the ultimate aim of the civil rights movement wasn't purely to win civil rights. There's a danger that we often can reduce Dr. King's bold prophetic message to his I have a dream speech or to freeze frame King in just one moment. 
and lose sight of the bolder vision behind his prophetic witness. That same witness that described the triplets of materialism, of racism, and of militarism that we must confront and overcome as a nation in order to help put us on the path of achieving a more perfect union. Well, Dr. King, right after the Montgomery bus boycott victory, described what the beloved community looks like. He said, the end, in other words, the end of the civil rights movement, its ultimate goal is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. It is this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opponents into friends. It is this type of goodwill that would transform the deep gloom of the old age into the exuberant gladness of the new age. It is this love which will bring about miracles in the hearts of men and women. I believe that this moral vision of the beloved community is broad enough to include disaffected white working class Americans who feel left behind and have been swayed by a politics of fear and contempt instead of a politics of hope and transformation. I believe the beloved community has arms wide enough to include all of America, including those known as dreamers and others in immigrant communities, those from religious traditions considered outside the mainstream, and those who have been left out and left behind, from Midwestern towns and rural farms to indigenous reservations and blighted cities and suburbs. It can include red, blue, and everything in between. But of course, achieving the beloved community will not be easy. And in many cases, in many respects, what you do in your church is a effort to create a beloved community. And that's extremely beautiful and important work. And we need those, those local examples. But I also believe that we need to catalyze a movement that can, can, can help build the beloved community at a macro scale, which I have the hope and maybe it's the audacity to believe is not just possible, it's imperative. My remixed version of the beloved community, building on so much of what Dr. King and other civil rights leaders had to say and to share, is to build a society in which everyone is seen, everyone is valued, everyone is respected, where everyone can thrive. It is building a society and a nation where our diversity is viewed as a strength and as an asset, not as a weakness or something to be feared, and put in more kind of policy-oriented terms. The beloved community is building a society in which neither punishment nor privilege is tied to race, to ethnicity, to gender, to ableness, to sexual orientation, or to gender identity. Now, I know that this can feel like a very big vision, and that bar of achieving a society where neither punishment nor privilege is tied to these core parts of identity seems like a very distant future. But I believe that we need to have a shared goal and a shared way to measure our progress. And that the vast majority of Americans would actually agree with that definition and that ultimate goal. Because it's a goal that is enshrined in our core Christian values and in a broader sense, our religious values as a nation. It is a goal that is enshrined in the promise of our creed of extending liberty and justice for all. One of the reasons I think the beloved community can be so powerful is it's a vision that hasn't yet been co-opted or mischaricatured by the, the right or by other forces. It's a vision that helps pull together some of the best of what sometimes can be considered a more conservative emphasis on community and responsibility with a more progressive emphasis on individual rights and on human dignity. And it is a vision that shows up in so many other cultural traditions and in so many other religions. I don't have time to spell out all of the examples, but it is represented in familia, family justice within the Latino and Latina tradition. It is found in the Korean cultural tradition through the word jung. It is found in the Jewish tradition through the understanding of tikkun olam, to repair the world. Yes, we are increasingly facing a choice between a politics division and what I call a politics of the common good. The politics of division trades in fear, hatred, and hypocrisy. What the theologian and great mystic Howard Thurman referred to as the three hounds of hell that track the disinherited. 
These hounds are the mortal enemies of Dr. King's dream of the beloved community and always have been. And so how do we get that dream back on track? How do we build the beloved community? When in my book, I describe what I refer to as seven beatitudes or seven commitments that can help enable us to build a beloved community. They include a, a commitment to Imago Dei equality based on the fundamental theological belief that we are made in the image and likeness of God. They include radical welcome. They include a bold commitment to nonviolence, which is not just an ethic, but it is a way of life. They include a commitment to dignity for all and environmental stewardship. And while I don't have time to unpack each of these, in my book, I give glimpses of how people are practically working to help to realize the beloved community in each of these different beatitudes. But I wanna close by focusing in, honing in on one beatitude that I think actually might be the most important one for us as a nation in this moment, particularly in light of our ongoing struggles against the COVID-19 pandemic and the related virus and systemic racism that continues to so often assault human dignity and disfigure American democracy. Ubuntu interdependence is something that I discovered when I had a chance to study abroad in 1996 in South Africa. It was a very formative and transformational time in my life. I learned from Archbishop Desmond Tutu who summarized Ubuntu best, which is that I am because we are. Or as Fannie Lou Hamer put it, nobody's free until everybody's free. Ubuntu is a radical commitment to our mutuality, to our interconnectedness. It is literally reflected in the Zulu greeting for how are you, which is Salbona, which is I see you. And the response is Siakona, I am here and I am seen. In other words, we cannot be fully whole unless we are seen, our humanity is affirmed by others. This is a, a really powerful way to understand what Ubuntu is all about. Well, in many respects, Ubuntu is also a kind of version of the golden rule, but I would say in a, in a kind of more vivid form. And there are many different metaphors throughout scripture that help to reinforce this commitment to interdependence. I wanna focus in this morning as I close on the words of the Apostle Paul who wrote to the church of Corinth, anguished at the degree of division that was ripping the church of Corinth apart at the seams. The church in Corinth was divided by a number of different doctrines and church personalities that were dividing that body in that particular city. Now it's important to remind ourselves that Corinth was a maritime city, one of the largest cities in the ancient world. It literally was a city that was known uh, for, for its vice, vice is, particularly as a place of hedonism and of ostentatious, ostentatious wealth. But behind that incredible wealth was a huge degree of severe inequality and poverty. I don't know if this sounds familiar at all. Yes, Corinth was a place where the church, instead of creating unity out of their diversity, the church was experiencing a high degree of division and rancor. And into this contentious moment steps the Apostle Paul, offering some timeless wisdom and some timeless prescriptions for how we can heal not just the body of the church, but I would argue the larger body of our nation and even our world. Paul provides one of the most powerful metaphors in all of scripture where he compares the health of the church to the health of a human body. And there are three critical pieces of wisdom that I think are, are essential to lift up that I would argue are critical for helping to cure the toxic polarization that has infected our politics. And that same toxic polarization is helping to fuel so much of the challenges we're facing around COVID. So much of the skepticism and resistance to wear masks, to get vaccinated, not only as a way to protect ourselves, but, for, but to protect others in our community and ultimately to help our nation promote the common good and, and, and turn the corner in this horrific pandemic. First, the Apostle Paul emphasizes that the parts of the body that are weaker are actually the most indispensable. Now this flips 
the thinking, our kind of capitalist thinking on its head. So often we treasure that we, we, we kind of lift up and exalt the strongest members of our body rather than the weakest. But Paul argues that no, it is actually the weakest parts of our body that are the most indispensable. He then goes on to say that it's that our part should have equal concern for another. Again, kind of another way to describe the golden rule commitment. And finally, Paul reminds us that if one part suffers, then all parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And put in the context of, the COVID, of, of our COVID pandemic, that means none of us are safe until all of us are safe. If one of us is infected, all of us are at the risk of becoming infected that we truly cannot heal the body without addressing and healing the weakest parts and protecting the weakest parts. I recently discovered just how powerful this really is as when I, when I had an injury about five years ago, I was a track athlete my entire life and often felt that I was invincible. This kind of shows my age, but just around the time that I turned 40, my younger son, my youngest son, my older son, sorry, he was five years old at the time, Joshua, was, we were coming out of church and he was running across the street and nearly got hit by a car. And I jumped into the street, pulled him back, and the process ended up throwing out my back. At first, I just thought it was kind of an isolated incident, but then I just kept re-triggering that same injury. Finally, after two years of pretty agonizing pain, my wife convinced me to go and see a specialist and ultimately to get a MRI, which revealed that I have a, a kind of fourth disc in my lower back is degenerated. That news was, was pretty demoralizing, particularly for someone that has tried and has been very active for their, their whole lives. And as I started to go into physical therapy, I started to learn that if I could be successful in strengthening those parts of my body that hold up my back and support my back, whether it's my core or my glutes or my hamstrings, that through a process of strengthening and healing, I could ultimately do many of the things that I love to do, including to run. In the process, I learned how important it is to help strengthen the weakest parts of my body. And again, I, I think this is just a powerful way to describe what the call of Ubuntu interdependence is in, in, our, in our current time particularly as we think about those who have experienced the most severe hardship in the context of the COVID pandemic and how in many ways COVID has been apocalyptic, revealing so much of the brokenness and the inequality that we knew was there before the pandemic hit. Yes, I believe that Ubuntu interdependence is just one of the Beatitudes that could help us to realize the beloved community. But what I love about the beloved community the most is it's not just a destination. It is also a journey. It's a journey that will require sacrifice. It will require vigilance, it will require courage, but it won't just be defined around struggle. The pursuit of the beloved community will also be filled with great joy. And in it, we will find deeper purpose, belonging and meaning. And ultimately, I believe this is a moral vision that could ultimately help create a new birth within our country, a third founding of our country, if you will. But it only can start with each and every one of us. So I'm prayerful that you will continue the beloved community revolution that is already happening all around us. It's happening in your church. I pray it's happening in Santa Barbara. And my hope is that what I just shared today, the book that I wrote, can be one more resource to catalyze that transformation. Because at the end of the day, the beloved community will prevail because I believe that all things are possible in Christ. Amen. Hi, Adam. Um, I'm Linnea. And I'm going to be kind of facilita facilitating a um, uh, question and answer period of time, if that's okay with you. Sure. So um, I thank you for, for your very inspiring talk. And yeah, really agree 
with everything you said. Um, I do have some questions, but I'm going to go ahead and open up the floor for anybody else who might like to probe some of these concepts. You can raise your hand physically or you can use the little hand under reactions. Michael. Uh, <clears throat> Reverend uh, Taylor, I feel guilty in bringing up this particular conundrum, but it's always, always there for me and it is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that there are people on the other side, people of goodwill. I'm going to make that assumption, and I, I need to make it. But So I think we feel like we're right, and certainly they feel like they're right. What little, how do we each take the first step? And as I'm asking them, I'm saying, yeah, we're willing to take the first step, but are they? So help. No, that's a great question. question. Yeah. Do you want to take a couple or do you want me to just do one at a time? I'm happy yeah, go ahead. That. Okay, great. Um, it is a great question. And I think one of the things that I admire most about King is that, you know, very much falling in the footsteps of Jesus, he refused to hate despite all that he experienced, death threats on his life, an attempted assassination on his life. And then ultimately we know that he lost his life through an assassination. But one of the things that he professed is that not only can our suffering be redemptive, that racism is you know, essentially a virus, if you will, that also hurts the oppressor, that you know, we have to kind of understand that it distorts God's image and that that ultimately is something that you know, is hurting, harming the oppressor as well as the oppressed. And so, you know, I, I guess, you know, part of it is really trying to, and you started this in your question, come from a, a place of grace, as hard as that can be. And I think we are also required and called by Christ to be truth tellers. Christ said that the whole truth will set us free. And sometimes those two things can be in tension with each other. And this is actually one of the things that was hardest about writing this book. I felt like I had to be true and faithful to my calling as a truth teller. And I told, tell like, a lot of truth about our history that a lot of people don't want to embrace or let alone kind of think about how that should impact the present or what we do to make amends for that history. But at the same time, I really try hard not to impugn the motives of those who disagree or not to, you know, kind of, you know, essentially create another us versus them kind of paradigm and instead say, I actually think there's a lot more that we share in common than we realize. And that we're only going to find some of that common ground if we're actually in relationship with each other. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I mean, there are some Americans, particularly those that showed up on January 6th, that I'm not sure that I can convince. You know, I believe in miracles, but, you know, I, I think they may be so far into their own kind of ideological mindset and, and, and really kind of white nationalist mindset that it's going to be hard to reach them. But even there, I mean, I feel like the calling of Christ is to still try to engage and convert. And ultimately, you know, I believe that anyone can be converted. Um, but, I, but I do think that a combination of deep listening, courageous relationship building, alongside some of the truth telling that we have to do as, as a country and as individuals is a, is a path of the, of the beloved community. I like... I like your um, contention that we need to keep engaging. We need to be in relation with in relationships with people like the ones who stormed the Capitol and so on. And you know, for many of us, we're flabbergasted by how many people like that there are. And remaining loving for me is the most difficult thing. Many people get so emotionally exhausted that they sever relationships and just for their mental health. And for me, I, I kind of weave in and out. And then I think, well, the people who are on the margins don't have the opportunity or the privilege to just um, 
check out for a while and rest. You know, they always have to be vigilant and always striving and always aware. So uh, what, let, I do have one question about the weakest people um, that Paul was talking about in Corinthians. Um, a situation that happened um, recently, there was a woman, I think it was a woman who was a hostess in a restaurant and three people from Texas came and when she asked them if they had vaccinations, which was a requirement of her employer, they, be, they began to punch her in the face and the stomach and beat her up and sent her to the hospital. So my question is, which, which people there would be those weaker members that deserve the most attention. And in a specific situation like that, say, if you were there or had access to any of these people, what would be a productive thing to say or do? Yeah, that's, that's a, a really heart-wrenching story. I mean, I think particularly if, if violence is involved, you know, try to protect that woman. Um, and hopefully, I don't, I don't know if there are any other bystanders that just watched it happen, but you know, it's really heartbreaking. So I, I don't think that any of us, wherever we are, kind of on the, the spectrum of weak versus strong. And, and don't get me wrong, like weak, weakness is not a pejorative category. It, it's really about you know, certain situations where you, know, you don't have the same rights and resources as someone else that may put you in a weaker position. And one of the things I mean, I didn't have a chance to kind of talk too much about this in my talk, but in the book, I have a chapter called E Pluribus Unum out of many one. And I really get into how do we understand our privilege and that we all enjoy privileges in certain situations and in certain parts of our identity. I have privilege as a, a male, a cisgender male, heterosexual male in different situations that, you know, I think puts an extra responsibility on me to interrupt situations of injustice or discrimination when you know someone who may be LGBTQ faces that in, in the workplace or somewhere else. So so all the all that to say is I mean I think in that situation, you know, she was targeted and attacked. That is wrong. Those individuals I believe should have been stopped and hopefully, you know, there's been some pursuit of justice in that situation. I don't know exactly how that how the you know how it ended. Um, and it's very hard if someone resorts to physical violence to, you know, talk them down. Although there are certainly skills that you can learn to try to de-escalate a situation and kind of practice conflict res resolution in a situation. Um, so the, you know that that's a little bit of an answer to that particular situation. But you know, my prayers go out to her. And, and I think underlying your question, or not question, but that story is the degree to which you know something is simple in some ways. And as life-saving as wearing a mask has become the latest casualty in, our, in our, our culture wars. Early in the pandemic, this was just a couple months in, I got so fed up, and I'm not one to be profane, but I got so fed up, I wrote an article, and the title was, For God's Sake, Wear a Damn Mask. And it was just basically my attempt to try to appeal to people and to say, like, if you really care about your community, your neighbor, or yourself, wearing a mask is an effective way to demonstrate love. And I know that not everyone agrees, you know, they're, 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 there's, there's a segment of the country that has literally made personal liberty an idol. Mm. And I think it's become a dangerous idol. And to me, the, the, the way we counteract that idol is through a greater commitment to Ubuntu interdependence. And so in any case, like just trying to share a little bit about your question. It's a great your story. Um, and I hope that helps. Anyone else along those lines or maybe yes, something different? My, hand, my, my hand's up. <laughs> oh, I didn't see it. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I I have a question for, for Adam, but first let me, I, let, uh, Linnea, you made me think of something that I, I was uh, around somebody this past Friday who was so at odds with her sister that she didn't talk to her from 2016 to 2020 
But then her sister had a change of heart and reached out to her just a couple of months ago. Wow. So I don't think there's a formula. You know, I'm not saying everybody should just cut off everybody who you know, you're annoyed with, but it worked in that case, it seems. Um, you know, but I, like, again, that's not, that's definitely not a formula. My, my question is, uh, uh, Adam, when you, when you were closing, talking about the beloved community, you said that it, it requires sacrifice, vigilance, and courage. Um, I would like to know how we can apply that to ourselves. You know, we, here we are, we're a small group, we're, you know, mostly Ventura County. Um, we love one another. I'm certainly in love with, with everybody here um, and grateful, just so grateful for everybody here. Um, and I'm just wondering how we can apply apply without you, you don't even know us, right? So, I mean, you haven't met us or anything, but maybe you've found, you've picked up some cues or noticed something that maybe we don't notice about who we are. How can we practice sacrifice, vigilance, and courage to be beloved community? No, that's a great question. Um, I think part of answering that question is to kind of do your own CAT scan of the deepest hurts and needs within your community. And you know, I don't know well enough to be able to kind of diagnose what those are. Maybe you've done that to a certain degree already. But you know, if policing, racialized policing is a major issue in your, in your area, what does it look like for your church to come alongside some of the organizations that are at the front lines of really trying to address that and transform our, our policing? I address that in the in the chapter of the book called uh, Imago Day Equality. Maybe it's homelessness, or maybe it's, you know, education system that is extremely broken and unequal, particularly for kids of color, or kids from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, it's probably a combination of these things, but like, you know, really try to do some deeper diagnosis about what are the most pressing hurts and needs and what could your congregation do both to meet maybe some of those immediate needs, but then also try to use your voice, your influence to address root causes of those needs, which is in my mind gonna require some advocacy, some engaging and activism that can better hold public officials, whether it's your, your mayor or others, your city council, et cetera, more accountable to the kind of changes that are needed so that everyone can experience fullness of life and, and thriving. So that, that's kind of where I would start. There's, um, believe me, I'm not <laughs> saying this to sell books, but my first book, Mobilizing Hope, does get a lot more into a lot of the how, um, where I kind of talk about what, what the how can look like, particularly from a, a organizing advocacy point of view. Um, but that that's at least one place to start. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds spot on. I like what you said too about, um, the only way forward is for a new moral vision and um, and sharing that. And you talked about coalitions. And um, I was wondering if you're familiar with this um, yearly coalition group called Solarize. Not actually. Okay. I was just curious. It's it's something that's because of COVID is both local and global. And Brian McLaren and Shane Claiborne and others, I think Richard Rohr, are or have been involved in it. And so I was just curious if you knew anything about that. Um, yeah, I definitely um, ought to learn more. I, I know both Shane pretty well and Brian and. So I'll, uh, I'll follow okay. up with them. Okay. Yeah. Lene, you Sorry. read uh, you read uh, Adam's latest book, right? I have. Oh, no, we just got it yesterday, but uh, okay. I've started reading it. Okay. Just and it looks really exciting. Yeah, I I've been trying to figure out how you know productive ways for crossing the big divide and. It seems so fruitless sometimes. It's almost like you're dealing with a cult that has 
lost their ability to reason, you know. Barbara, just real Chan, quick, Barbara I, I, was... I did... Oh. Go to Barbara, but I also see Michael's question, which kind of ties into that. I'm happy to answer that too. Yeah, okay, Barbara? Yeah, I just wanted to um, put in a plug for Sojourner Magazines. I've been a follower of it and I've been reading it for about 20 years. I, um, as a follower of Jim Wallace, uh, it's really, really an amazing magazine and really goes a, a lot of deep dives in, um, into almost everything from the environment to systemic racism to critical. I mean, every single month, it's, it's an amazing magazine. So I just kind of wanted to put that plug in for it. And it's really great to just even meet you, Adam. Um, I'm really interested too, and I, I don't know, maybe your book covers this, but the whole connection between materialism, militarism, and racism, I think I would just love to learn more about the connection there. Yeah, well, thanks for the, the shout out. I'm glad <laughs> to, to hear that you've been reading for 20 years. And I should have mentioned actually that we are, we as in Sojourners are entering into our 50th anniversary year as an organization, our kind of jubilee year, if you will. We don't get a year of rest, but we, we do get to celebrate. <laughs> And so uh, we're excited about that. So no, I mean, King was very prophetic in naming these three triplets of racism, militarism, and materialism. And they do very much feed each other. Um, there's, there's parts of the book where I do talk about the relationship between them, particularly in the context of you know, our ongoing struggle to address the crisis of poverty. You know, sadly, what we've made some progress and more recent progress because fortunately, many of us were pushing for a very long time to get an extension to the child tax credit and make that refundable and permanent. And fortunately through the America Rescue Plan, that happened. So that was a huge policy victory that literally has already lifted millions of kids off out of poverty because you know families that are struggling are getting checks every month from the IRS that are directly designed to keep their kids out of poverty and provide the support they need um, in order to hopefully thrive. And so um, we're now fighting really hard to make that permanent um, through you know, these bills that are being debated right now. There's a kind of a reconciliation package, which we're describing as the family care package that would, would do just that, but it's not guaranteed. And so we really need as much advocacy, pressure and support as we can get um, in order to get that passed. The, the thing that breaks my heart and that, you know, I was reflecting on this in the context of the 20th anniversary of 9-11 is, you know, not only should we, you know, lament the loss of life as a result of 9-11 and all the wars that were created after 9-11, but the part that sometimes we don't talk about as much is just the trillions of dollars that was wasted as a part of our effort to get revenge and our very myopic way of understanding what it means to keep us safe. And, you know, our Sojourners was against both wars from the beginning. We still have argued that they were unnecessary. And, you know, ultimately they cost both human life, but also cost a huge fortune in our budgetary expenditures. And so, you know, this kind of connection between these, these three different triplets is extremely important to, to emphasize. There's so much more to say there, but let me, let me stop there. I just wanted to quickly in response to Michael's really good question is that it is hard, particularly in this moment where there's so much disinformation, particularly so much of it promulgated through social media to be able to have a shared sense of truth. And, you know, our news media, or at least the news media a lot of people are consuming is increasingly very biased and you know, filled with a lot of disinformation, not just Fox, but, but other news outlets as well. And so I think part, part of the challenge comes back to churches in terms of how can churches become a place where people can both get, hopefully, access to factual good information, but also to have real dialogue about what is truth. I mean, that to me is a fundamental, you know, theological and spiritual question. And how can we try to fix and transform our education system, as well as other civic places where people get education about our history so that we have a shared baseline of understanding of 
American history. So, so one of the things that I, I talk about in the book, I have the privilege of, of teaching a, a course for Pepperdine University. I don't get to go to Malibu, but I, I teach it here in DC and really bright students that I get to teach. And when I teach them a class that starts to get into some of these core parts of our history, particularly in relation to, to kind of slavery and all the mutated forms of slavery through our history, I am kind of shocked at how little these students learned as they're growing up about the period of Reconstruction and what led to the end of Reconstruction, about the Southern strategy and how that overt political strategy continues to influence our politics today and help to fuel the uh, kind of mass incarceration crisis that we're in now. They know very little about the lost cause narrative or about the Chinese Exclusion Act or just a whole series of things. And I'm not saying this to be critical of them. I'm just saying to say there's, there's a fundamental failure in our education system when it comes to helping people understand some of the core parts of our history that continue to influence the, the present. And now we see this backlash against efforts to really teach the whole truth about our history. We saw it with the 1619 Project by the New York Times, and now we're seeing these bills that are kind of attacking critical race theory, which is a complete distraction because our actual goal is to try to limit how we teach about systemic racism. So all that to say is, you know, this is going to be easy. There's, it's not, there's no easy fix here, but I feel like we need to have, you know, a greater commitment to teaching our whole history. And we need to create more spaces where we can have that kind of civil dialogue about what is the truth. And to me, the church should be one of those places. Very good. Totally. Quick questions before we close. Are we going, we don't go into small groups again, do we? We want to move towards communion. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you so much for that very enlightening. And I'm going to have to get the first book too, because <laughs> you mentioned that there, are, there is a lot of uh, discussion of how to, how do we actually go about accomplishing what we need to do. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, I thank you too, as Linnea said, Michael, uh, Adam, but I also, I want to thank you for living and working in Washington, DC. Um, you know, that's just a whole, you know, we are people all over the country who are doing what we can, but we don't live there at ground zero. Um, and I know it's a different kind of experience. Maybe you could say a word about what it's like to do what you do right there in the Capitol. Yeah, thanks for that. And I just put my chat and I welcome your prayers. And I mean that. <laughs> I really believe in the power of prayer. But it's hard. I, I, I never expected to live in DC. I actually grew up in the other Washington state. So I was born near Seattle or north of Seattle and then finished my high school career in Tucson. But it felt, kind of felt called um, to work at the intersection of faith and politics. And for better or for worse, this is kind of where it happens in DC. I would say that, you know, there are two different DCs. There's kind of the political DC, people that are connected to politics and their livelihood is connected to politics. And then there's like a whole other part of the city that's just trying to survive that, you know, has loves the city, but also, you know, there's a huge degree of, of inequality and poverty that still exists in various pockets of Washington DC. And so, I mean, I really hope that we can kind of reconcile those two. <laughs> and, you know, unfortunately the political part has become, you know, very, uh, yeah, just, just very infected by the same things that we talked about in this talk, in this sermon. So I don't think the solutions are primarily gonna come from our politics. I really think the moral vision that we need is gonna have to come from outside of it. And that doesn't mean that politicians don't have a key role to play, they do. But, you know, we need, I think, the church and other you know, faith leaders, and even, you know, it doesn't, it's not just religious, it could be other kind of secular leaders casting the kind of vision and acting on that vision that then ultimately forces our politicians to, to change. Well, again, thank you. We're going to have communion and
I'm going to ask everybody to prepare yourself as we pray. As Adam talked about DC being two cities in many ways, this is two countries and sometimes it's a it's two worlds and we decide we choose to to be on Lazarus's side who um, just wanted to survive we identify with those who are trying to survive while the rich man behind his gates may not even know that we exist, that these people exist. Or maybe they do know, but they're just indifferent. Or maybe some even just feel powerless, so they give up. But in communion, we are reminded of the cross and how you went all the way, Jesus. How you didn't give up. How you gave everything to the point of apparent futility, but you kept giving, you kept healing, you kept teaching. May we be infused. I think of how you breathed on them and said, be filled with the Holy Spirit. We, we ask that we would be breathed on today, that Adam would be breathed upon that wherever we are in our in our living rooms and bedrooms